Celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia this year helps prepare us for an even bigger celebration in three years. The 500th anniversary of the Reformation started by Martin Luther. And yet, as distant as these two events seem from one another, separated as they are by 350 years, still they share one important thing in common. These anniversaries were both born in educational institutions. Indeed, Martin Luther's Reformation cannot be understood apart from the University of Wittenberg where it all began. Look at the facts. When we talk about Martin Luther, we should really call him Professor Martin Luther, or as his students often did in the 16th century, Dr. Martinus, literally Teacher Martin. First trained at the University of Erfurt, where he received his bachelor's and master's degree. Luther then became an Augustinian friar and was ordered to do graduate work in theology, which led him to the fledgling University of Wittenberg, founded in 1502, where he received his doctorate in 1512 and began lecturing on the Psalms in 1513. With few exceptions, where he lectured on New Testament books, Martin Luther was, for the most part, professor of Hebrew scriptures, teaching himself Hebrew, leading the translation of the Old Testament and Apocrypha into German, and producing countless lectures and commentaries on Genesis, on the book of Psalms, Exodus, the Minor Prophets, parts of Isaiah, Deuteronomy, the list goes on and on. If we add Luther's partner, Philip Melanchthon, who joined the faculty in 1518 to the mix, we find a Greek scholar of first rank who lectured on Romans, Colossians, John, Matthew, and other biblical books, as well as on what we would call systematic theology, church history, and hermeneutics. He even wrote a guide to preaching. Other lesser known lights, such as Justus Jonas, or Justice Jonas, Nicholas von Amstorf, Johannes Bugenhagen, also Wittenberg's chief preacher, taught alongside Luther and Melanchthon. Thus, whatever else the Lutheran Reformation was about, it was a remarkable shift in theological education where the Bible, rather than medieval scholastic theology, the history of the early church and the writings of the, its bishops and leaders, rather than the law of church discipline, and the systematic heart of biblical Christianity, rather than the opinions of later theologians, became the center of education. Indeed, the curricula of LTSP over the past 150 years still reflects Wittenberg's pedagogical revolution by centering this institution's teaching on the Bible, systematic theology, church history, and practical theology. When each year since 1864, people have gathered to listen to professors lecture, to take exams at year's end, to graduate, they are standing in a tradition now over 500 years old. To be sure, most oral exams have been replaced with written ones or term papers. Many lectures are more interactive, although there was plenty of interaction going on in Wittenberg, too. And graduation today has a bit more pomp and circumstance than the individual letters of recommendations and the rec records in the dean's lists of yesteryear. And yes, they had deans in those days, too. But underneath the practices then, and now is the conviction that knowing the faith matters for those who would profess it. That anti-intellectual movements of Luther's day and ours hurt the church. That an informed clergy and rostered leadership strengthen the Christian witness to the gospel. Perhaps one of the strongest indications of just how much we owe the reformers and the University of Wittenberg as we celebrate our 150th anniversary comes from the revised statutes 
of the Wittenberg's theological faculty, written in 1533 by Philip Melanchthon himself. In his concluding words, he manages to broaden his own students' horizons and ours, and he sets what we do at Mount Airy into the entire sweep of the Bible and church history. Even more importantly, his closing wish could well echo our own mission statement as we administer the gospel today. I quote, finally, let them remember that this theological assembly ought to be similar to the schools of Elijah, Elisha, John the Baptist, Christ, John the Evangelist, Polycarp, Irenaeus, and similar people. For whenever the church flourished, it had some such scholarly assemblies through which godly teaching was propagated. May our assemblies also imitate their studies and mores. What more can be said than that?